My parents in the 1960s were both in the entertainment industry. My mother was a model and my father was a well-known actor. They were two of what you could call the beautiful people. But behind that beautiful exterior was a rather shoddy backstory that involved a lot of alcohol and a lot of drugs. Now, as a little girl of five, I remember praying every night. In fact, my mum said to me just a few days ago, I was speaking with the family and we were wondering why you're such an extremist now. I said, oh, that's nice. What was the conclusion? Well, I brought it back to you always being a strange little girl who used to pray. She's partly right. I'm not an extremist, inshallah, but I did used to pray. And I remember being five years old and my grandmother taught me the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer is a Christian prayer. It's actually made by Isa, alayhi salam, as he submitted to the will of Allah before his disciples. So I used to make that prayer and then follow it with an appeal to the one God who ruled over everything. Because in a child's mind, faith is very simple. There's no buy one, get one free God. There's no buy one, get three free God. There's just a had, just one. So I knew that in my life, my mother made a lot of decisions. My dad made a few. My grandfather made a few decisions. My grandmother made the most decisions. We were a matriarchal family. But above them all, who was running the outside world? Who was making the leaves grow on the trees? That wasn't my grandmother. Who was making the stars shine at night? Who was making the sun rise in the morning? That was the one God. And I used to pray so hard that I even remember one of my prayers. And it was this. Dear God, please take my younger sister away. She's really horrible. But Allah is merciful, and she's with us today, alhamdulillah. But I knew who to appeal to, and that carried me through my whole childhood. That absolute knowledge, that certainty that God was out there. And then come the teenage years. And they are a danger zone in every community, in every time. So my teenage years came. And with it, two things happened. First, the ego comes in. You become one of those youngsters who knows everything about everything. Who's got teenage children here? Right. Have you ever heard this phrase, what do you know about anything? My grandfather fought in the Second World War five, in five of the invasions of the Second World War. And I used to stand toe to toe to him when I was 15 going, what do you know about life? <laughs> I think he knew quite a bit in hindsight. So the nafs come in, the ego comes in, and with that comes another catastrophe. Potentially the hormones come in. What a mess we get ourselves into. But if you add into my teenage years the fact that my friend's mum was giving us drugs, got kind of a toxic mix. I tried, I tried to hold on to my prayer, I did. But one night a friend from school, she came over to stay at my house and as we were going to sleep I put my hands together and started to pray. Dear God, please bless mummy and daddy, dear God. My friend started to snigger. <laughs> that sound that only teenage girls make. What are you doing? She said. I said, I'm praying. She said, who are you praying to? The big man on the cloud with a beard, Santa Claus. Children are very practical. I tried to have an image of my head of what God looked like. If he was a man like my dad, my dad make mistakes. Did that mean God, the father, could make mistakes? And actually, if God was on a cloud, why couldn't I see him on a rainy day? My faith began to melt away. 
How hard it is to hold on to that rope of iman, the rope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, ties us, that belief ties us to him and to safety. My hands started to slide off. After that, I became a journalist and I started to write and I became what we might call a minor celebrity. But I used to love the applause, that's why I can talk about it. I trained as an actress and I was an actress for seven years and if you speak to any actor and say, why do you do a job that makes you mostly poor, you know, uh, get into all kinds of situations, why do you put up with it? They will say the applause. It's addictive. It's like a drug. When you're in that state, you want it. You want the fame. And people will give it to you. And I had a little bit of it. And it became quite toxic. I was a minor celebrity who, in my world, thought I was the major celebrity in the universe. Because everybody became a little star in my orbit of ego. My husband at the time, my kids, my parents, everything revolved around my nafs. What's the moment when the light got in? When did you first feel that the universe was about something different? When did that happen? And I've thought about this long and hard. And it comes down to this moment for me. In 2000, I had my first daughter. Her name is Alexandra. And you know the birth of a first child for both parents, but I promise you, especially for the mother, is a moment of transcendence. You, or you leave your body, you, you, your heart bursts with a love you didn't even know was there when you first look into those eyes. And more than that, you want the world to be a better place. I went instantly overnight from someone who used to listen to Eminem and rap stars to someone who didn't like loud music too much. Well, not that kind of music because I didn't want women to be abused. I didn't want that kind of language around my daughter in the year 2000, in December, my daughter was a month old and I was holding her to me and I was watching the evening news and a photograph came on that would change my life. And it was this photograph. There is a young boy, he looks 10 years old, but actually he's 14, he's small for his age. And all you can see is the back of him because the cameraman is behind him. And the little boy is standing like this. And what is amazing is that he's about to throw something. It's a dynamic photograph. But what is more amazing, brother and sisters, brothers and sisters, is that just a few meters away, gigantic, bearing down on him is a tank. Now, if you and I were here, I didn't tell you he had a stone in his right hand, did I? If you and I, may Allah protect us, ever came face to face from a tank, my bet is we'd run. That's the human instinct. But this little boy, he was leaning into the tank. He was going to throw his stone without fear, no matter what happened to him. And I knew, sitting there with my new baby, I knew the men in that tank were afraid of him and he was not afraid of that tank. The newscaster told me the boy's name was Faris O'Day and he came from a place called Rafa Refugee Camp that I'd never heard of. And I want you to remember that name because it comes up later in my story. And I didn't know it at the time. But nine days after that photo, Faris O'Day was shot dead by an Israeli sniper. You see, he was Palestinian. The bullet went into his throat and he bled to death on the floor of his refugee camp 
protecting the women of his village with a stone. Now that photo and the Qadr of Allah is the only explanation I have for everything that has happened since, even leading up to right being here today. Because I have been aware that I have not been guiding my ship for a very long time. And we all have moments where we think we're in charge, right? And it's good to have a plan. We're encouraged to have aspirations. But what if you let go of the steering wheel of your life? Who's actually guiding you? In 2005, I had a very good job as a journalist with a newspaper called The Mail on Sunday. I had a photo above a whole page, which is a bit like being a Hollywood star in media terms. I lived in a house in France with a big garden and a swimming pool and a husband and two children and everything that you could want in dunya. So why did I do this? Tell me. Why did I walk into my boss's office and say the words, I want to go to Palestine. I don't know. All I know is that I felt as if an, innocent, uh, an invisible hand was propelling me into that office and I had to go. I had to go. In the way that sometimes if you're pregnant, you have to eat beans with cheese. I had to go. And my editor, he could have said, don't be ridiculous. You write about London life. You write about living in France. You don't write about the Middle East. Go away. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you can go to the left a bit. You can go to the right a bit. But you're going to reach the same destination that's been written for you. And the only question is, how much difficulty you put yourself through to get there? In January 2005, I found myself standing outside Tel Aviv airport with two weeks paid for by my boss to go and report on the um, elections in the West Bank. Now I knew so little about Palestine that I was standing there thinking, okay, how do I get from Israel to Palestine? I didn't know it was one place, subhanAllah. Man-made lines, by the way, don't count. This is Allah's world. As I was standing there wondering what to do next, a man came over to me and he said, Hi, my name is Jamal, but you can call me Jimmy. I said, Hi, Jimmy. He said, I am a taxi driver. So he said he was a taxi driver from Jerusalem. And I got into his car and he was to drive me to Ramallah. Over the next 65 minutes, Jimmy Jamal gave me 65 years of Palestinian history. It's quite a journey. But what I remember about that drive is that when we got into the rolling hills of the Holy Land, the beautiful place that pulls so many billions of people to it from around the world, the place where every rock cries Allah, where every olive and every tree shouts the names of the prophets. I remember being in the car and we were approaching a checkpoint and it was very busy, but on the mountain, on the hillside, was an empty road going in the same direction. So I said to my driver, uh, I know it's my first day here, but can we use that road on the hill because we'll get there quicker? He looked at me like I was crazy. Are you sure you're a journalist because you don't know much about Palestine? I said, I am a journalist. He said, look, that road up there is for Jews only. If I, an Arab Palestinian, take you there, we'll be shot dead in maybe five minutes. Still, you want to try? I said, no. I didn't want to try. One word came into my mind, and it was apartheid. And I don't want to get you guys into trouble. 
But we do have a right to talk about these things, you know. We have a right of citizens of whatever country we're in to have these debates. And I'm just repeating what I saw. When I arrived at my hotel room in Ramallah that first ever night in the Holy Land, I cried myself to sleep. Why? Because I'd seen one checkpoint and one apartheid road. And every single day of my waking life since, I wished that was the only problem that the people of Palestine have. There is a symptom that people who go to Gaza have, an illness I should say, we call it Gazaitis. And it's actually not something that poisons you, it's a blessing, but it makes you ill. You see, anybody who goes to Gaza from the outside with an open heart, we want to go back. We want to go back as often as we can. Now, I didn't know this in 2006 when I made an excuse to go back to Palestine. I just knew I wanted to meet the people again. And this time, I had an experience of going through Erez. Erez is like a visit to hell. The people of Gaza, they don't frighten easily. But if you say Erez, everybody shudders. Erez is the checkpoint from hell, a place of ritual humiliation, a place where voices you can't see shout at you to take bits of your clothing off, pick things up, take things off, open this, shut that, for miles and miles. I was there waiting to leave. I'd done some writing and I was about to leave and it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I knew that as a foreigner, I had a chance to get through in three hours. And I realized that I'd need a taxi at one o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I spoke to you earlier about dower. Listen to this. I looked in my bag and I thought, how am I going to get a taxi from Erez in Israel to Jerusalem? I'm going to be stuck. I looked in my bag because I keep cards when I travel. And the card said, Jamal, taxi driver, Al-Quds. I thought, brilliant, I'll call him. There's no way that he'll come all the way from Jerusalem to Gaza to the Erez crossing, but still he might know another taxi driver and he won't remember me, but he seemed like a nice guy. This is the conversation. Hello, is that Jimmy Jamal? Is that Lauren Booth? The Son of Allah has arisen again over our blessed land. My wife will stop crying. My children will eat again. Allahu Akbar, welcome back to your home. We have missed you. Subhanallah, one taxi drive? The love, the love these people give. The love of the language of Arabic that we've been given. I said to Jimmy Jamal, um, I'm going to be at the checkpoint at one o'clock. Will you be able to meet me? He said, no problem. But that's not what happened, brothers and sisters. At 10 o'clock in the morning at the Erez checkpoint, I was with World Health Organization workers, members of the UN, members of the general public in Palestine, some uh, ministers from the Fatah government, the Minister for um, Airlines. The Israelis kept us waiting. And there was an old lady in a wheelchair. And she was proudly telling everybody her story. I'm going to America, she said. My son lives in America. My son is paying for me to have expensive operation in America and I'm going to walk again because I'm going to America. Did I tell you my son is in America? <laughs> over and over we heard this and everybody was really excited for her. And around 11 o'clock she was called through the horrible checkpoint and she was wheeled off and we waved her off. As she went to her adventure to America. At midday she was wheeled back. She said, I don't think they're going to let me go. They said uh, they don't have coordination. This is a big game. 
Coordination is imaginary. It's somebody flicking a switch or ticking a box. She had coordination. She had permission. We all rallied round and said to the Palestinian coordinator, make them take her or we're going to cause some problems. At one o'clock, Majdi was taken back through the checkpoint. We waved her off again and we waited. The longer we waited, the more sure we were that she'd gone. At four o'clock, she was wheeled back screaming. She'd missed her flight. She wasn't going to America. She was crying and screaming in Arabic, why are they doing this to me? I'm an old lady, I'm not a terrorist. Around five o'clock, everybody was allowed through the checkpoint from hell, myself included. My phone was dead, of course, and I'd booked the taxi at one o'clock in the afternoon, and I found myself standing in kind of a big industrial zone in the middle of Israel, in the middle of nowhere. And I thought, what am I going to do now? And then a car came quickly towards me, reversing with a screech of tires. And I thought, okay, what now? A door flew open. And Jimmy Jamal said, Salaam alaikum. You want a taxi? I was confused. I said, yes, I ordered a taxi, but for one o'clock, five hours ago. He said, yes, I waited. I said, I I'm sorry. <laughs> You waited five hours? He said, of course. I said, why? He said, because I'm Muslim. And a Muslim would never leave a woman on her own and at risk. I got into his car and I started to cry. And it was one of those big cries that you do that you don't want men to see. The ones that go... <laughs> and they're not at all like the soap operas with just a tear. They'd sort of snort and... <laughs> now, being an Arab, of course, he was very, very sympathetic. He said, stop crying, you're hysterical. I'll have to take you to hospital. But I couldn't stop crying. You're so nice and they're so horrible and it's so wrong. And <laughs> in the end, he wouldn't let me stay in the hotel that I had booked. I went and stayed with his wife in their house. I've been their guest ever since on my journeys. May Allah bless them.